we're getting there. There's only a few chapters left. Let's see what happens to Brian. I mean, he has had quite the adventure. He's been there for 45 days or more, stuck on that, in the wilderness somewhere, we, learning to survive on his own, learning to provide food and shelter, and he's even created a little fish pond area to keep fish so he could eat. Let's see where the next few chapters take. So chapter 15 and 16. The day had folded one into another and mixed so that after two or three weeks, he only knew time had passed in days because he made a mark for each day in a stone near the door to his shelter. Real time, he measured in events. A day was nothing, not a thing to remember. It was just sun coming up, sun going down, some light in the middle. But events, events were burned to his, into his memory, and so he used them to remember time, to know and to remember what had happened, to keep a mental journal. There had been the first day of fresh, there had been the day of first meat. There had been a day that had started like the rest after the sun clean the camp and make sure there's enough wood for another night. But it was a long time, a long time of eating fish and looking for berries. And he craved more, he craved more food, heavier food, deeper food. He craved meat. He thought in the night now of meat, thought of his mother's cooking a roast or dreamed of turkey. And one night he awakened before he had put the wood on the fire and his mouth making saliva, and the taste of pork chops in his mouth. Mm, so real, so real, and all a dream, but it left him intent on getting meat. He'd been working father and father out for wood, sometimes now going nearly a quarter of a mile away for a camp wood, and he saw many squirrels, small red ones that chattered at him and seemed to swear he jumped from limb to limb. There were also many rabbits, large gray ones with a mix of reddish fur, faster small gray ones that he only saw at dawn. The larger ones sometimes sat until he was quite close, then bounded and jerked two or three steps before freezing again. He thought if he worked at it and practiced, he might hit one of the larger rabbits with an arrow or a spear. Never the small ones or the squirrels. They were too small and fast. Then there were the fool birds. They exasperated him to the point where they were close to driving him insane. The birds were everywhere, five and six in a flock, and the camouflage was so perfect that it was impossible for Brian to sit and rest, leaning against a tree, with one of them standing right in front of him in a willow clump, two feet away, hidden, only to explode into definitely deafening flight just when Brian least expected it. He couldn't see them. Couldn't figure out how to locate them before they flew because they stood so perfectly still and blended in so perfectly well. That's what made it, and what made it worse was that they were dumb or seemed to be dumb. And that was almost insulting the way they kept hidden from him, nor could he get used to the way they exploded up when they flew. It seemed like every time he went, to f went for wood, which was every morning, he spent the whole time jumping and jerking in fright as they walked as he walked. And on one memorable morning, he'd actually reached for a piece of wood that he thought to be a pitchy stump at the base of a dead birch, his fingers close to touching it, only to have it blow up in his face. But on the day of first meet, he decided the best thing to try for would be a fool bird. And that morning, he had set out with his bow and spear to get one, to stay with it until he got one and ate some meat not to get wood, not to find berries, but to get a bird and eat some meat. At first, the hunt had not gone well. He saw plenty of birds working up along the shore of the lake to the end, then down the other side, but he only saw them after they flew. He had to find a way to see them first, see them and get close enough to, eat, to either shoot them with his bow or use his spear, and he could not find a way to see them. When he'd gone halfway around the lake, he had jumped up twenty or so birds. He finally gave up and sat at the base of a tree. He had to work this out, see what he had, was doing wrong. There were birds there, and he had eyes. He just had to bring the two together. 
looking wrong, he thought. I am looking wrong. More and more than I am being wrong somehow, I am doing it the wrong way. Fine, sarcasm came into his thoughts. I know that, thank you. I know I'm doing it wrong, but what is right? The morning sun had cooked him until it seemed his brain was frying, sitting there by the tree, but nothing came until he got up and started to walk again. He hadn't gone two steps when the bird got up. It had been there all the time while he was thinking about how to see them, right next to them, right there. He almost screamed, but this time when the bird flew, something caught his eye. It was the secret key. The bird cut down toward the lake, then seeing it couldn't land in the water, turned up and flew back up the hill into the trees. When it turned, curving through the trees, the sun had caught it, and Brian, for an instant, saw it as a shape, a sharp point in the front, back from the head, and a streamlined bullet shaped to the fat body. Kind of like a pear, he thought, with a point on one end and a fat little body, a flying pear. And that had been the secret. He had been looking for feathers, for the color of the bird, for a bird sitting there. He had to look for the outline instead. He had to see the shape instead of the feathers or the color. He had to train his eyes to see the shape. It was like turning on a television. Suddenly he could see things he never saw before. In just moments it seemed he saw three birds before they flew. Saw them sitting and got close to one of them moving slowly, got close enough to try a shot with his bow. He had missed that time and missed many more. But he saw them. He saw the little fat shapes with the pointed head sitting in the brush all over the place. Time and again he drew, held, and let arrows fly. But he still had no feathers on the arrows, and they were little more than sticks that flopped out of the bow, sometimes going sideways. Even when a bird was seven or eight feet away, the arrow would turn without feathers to stabilize it and hit a brush or a twig. After a time he gave up with the bow, it worked all right for the fish, but when it came right to the end of the arrow, but it wasn't any good for a kind of distance, at least not that way it was now. He had carried his fish spear, the original one with the two prongs, and he moved the bow to his left hand and carried the spear in his right. He thought of throwing the spear, but he was not good enough or not fast enough. The birds could fly amazingly fast, get up fast, but in the end he found that if he saw the bird sitting and moved sideways toward it, not directly toward it, but an angle, back and forth, he could get close. Close enough to put the spear point out ahead almost to the bird and thrust and lunge with it. He came close twice, and then, down along the lake not far from the beaver house, he got his first meat. The birds had sat and he had lunged and the two points took the bird back down to the ground and killed it almost instantly. It had fluttered a bit and Brian grabbed it and held it in both hands until he was sure it was dead. Then he picked up the spear and the bow and trotted back to the lake to a shelter where the fire had burned down to glowing coals. He sat looking at the bird wondering <laughs> what to do now. With the fish he just cooked them whole, left everything in and picked the meat off. This was different. He would have to clean it. It had always been so simple at home. He would go to the store and get a chicken, and it was all clean and neat. No feathers or insides. And his mother would bake it in the oven, and he would eat it. His mother from time, his mother from the old time, from the time before, would bake it. Now he had the bird, but he had never cleaned one, never taken the insides out or gotten rid of the feathers, and he didn't know where to start. But he wanted meat. He had to have the meat, and that drove him. In the end, the feathers came off easily. He tried to pluck them out, but the skin was so fragile that it pulled off as well. So he just pulled off the skin of the bird, like peeling an orange, he thought, sort of. Except that when the skin was gone, the insides fell out the back end. He was immediately caught in a cloud of raw odor, a kind of steamy dung odor that came up from the greasy coil of insides that fell from the birds, and he nearly threw up. But there was something else to the smell as well. Some kind of richness that went with his hunger, and that overcame the sick smell. He quickly cut off the neck with his hatchet, cut off the feet the same way, and in his hand he held something like a small chicken with dark, fat, thick breast and small legs. He set it on, up on some sticks in the shelter wall and took the feathers and insides down to the water to his fish pond. The fish would eat them or eat what they could 
and the feeding action would bring more fish. On second thought, he took out the wing and tail feathers, which were stiff and long and pretty, and banded and speckled in brown and gray and light reds. There might be some use for them, he thought. Maybe work them onto the arrows somehow. The rest he threw into the water, saw the small round fish begin tearing at it, and washed his hands. Back at the shelter, the flies were on the meat, and he brushed them off. It was amazing how fast they came. But when he built up the fire and the smoke increased, the flies almost magically disappeared. He pushed a pointed stick through the bird and held it over the fire. The fire was too hot. The flames hit the fat and the bird almost ignited. He held it higher, but the heat was worse. He fi finally, he moved it to the side of it, and there it seemed to cook properly, except that it only cooked on one side and all the juice dropped off, dripped off. He had to rotate it slowly, and that was hard to do with his hand, so he found a forked stick and stuck it into the sand and put his cooking stick in it. He turned it, and in this way he found a proper method to cook the bird. In minutes, the outside was cooked, and the odor that came up was almost the same odor when his mother baked chickens in the oven. And he didn't think he could stand it, but when he tried to pull a piece of the breast meat off, the meat was still raw inside. Patience, he thought. So much of this was patience, waiting and thinking and doing things right. So much of this, so much... Of all living was patience and thinking. He settled back, turning the bird slowly, letting the juices go back into the meat, letting it cook and smell and, and smell and cook. And there came a time when it didn't matter if the meat was done or not. It was black on the outside and hard and hot, and he would eat it. He tore a piece from the breast, a sliver of meat, and put it in his mouth and chewed carefully. Chewed as slowly and carefully as he could get. All the taste, and he thought, never, never in all the food, all the hamburgers and malt and all the fr fries or meals at home, never in all the candy or pies or cakes, never in all the roasts or steaks or pizzas, never in all the submarine sandwiches, never, never had he tasted anything as fine as that first bite, first meat. And I'm going to end there with just chapter 15 this time, and I will post chapter 16 and 17 in a short while. So enjoy chapter 15.